Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And uh, I'm, I was just mentioning to Cheyenne, I'm so lucky to be a part of such a great group of people here uh, where we're able to spur some great discussions and important conversations around uh, fat disorders. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about Durkheim's disease following COVID-19. Over the past few years, uh, following the pandemic, we've noticed uh, a, a potential trend among people who have had COVID and Durkheim's, and we're going to be exploring some of that today. Uh, and before I move on, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Herbs, Dr. Jamie Schwartz, uh, Dr. Eicher, for uh, being so supportive of me and helping us with this research to uh, really explore the connection between Durkheim's and COVID. So just to begin, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, and Dr. Herbs gave a great explanation of what Durkheim's disease is, but just to summarize in one slide, uh, Durkheim's is a, a rare inflammatory disease uh, of the subcutaneous adipose tissue. And the hallmark of it is really the uh, painful masses, the lipomas that can exist throughout the body. Uh, there's, the pathophysiology of it is still uh, up to debate and we're still trying to figure out what the specific cause is. And as Dr. Herbst mentioned, there's a lot of unique uh, exploration that exists with how Durkheim's is being uh, presented in different people. So that's a whole field in and of itself. Today we're just gonna be focusing in on one uh, known aspect of Durkheim's, which is that it's known to develop in association with inflammation. And that is a big key point to its, uh, its cause by infection. So there's been a great uh, paper, it came out in 2019, by, uh, co-authored by Dr. Herbst, and it looks at different infections that have been known to be associated with Durkheim's disease. And we'll take a look at some of those. Uh, we have influenza, uh, herpes, measles, malaria, coccidi coccidioidomycosis, a lot of infections that precede uh, the development of Durkheim's. And these have been known for a long time. Since the late 1800s, there's been reports and publications about the connection of infection to uh, Durkheim's disease. And COVID is now, we believe, going to be an addition on this list of infections that cause Durkheim's or are associated with the development of Durkheim's. Now, turning our attention to COVID. Uh, why are we exploring this and why is it important? Uh, we're first going to talk about why COVID might have a link to Durkheim's and then we'll cover uh, a few case examples of patients that we've seen uh, that have developed Durkheim's disease following uh, a severe infection of COVID-19. So there's a lot of different potential mechanisms that link COVID-19 and, uh, and Durkheim's disease. One of which that we want to focus on today is mast cells, because mast cells uh, are cells that are involved in many different immune processes, uh, but one of the main things they do is uh, inflammation, playing a role in inflammation throughout the body. Uh, Dr. Afrin uh, last year gave a great talk on uh, mast cell activation and its connection to uh, different diseases, its different pathophysiologies. Uh, one of which recently we're starting to see is that mast cell activation symptoms are prevalent in a lot of people with long COVID. So that's been an association that's been published uh, in a few different cases across the country and across the world. Uh, there's also been Durkheim's disease associated with mast cell activation. So we're seeing some associative, potential associative factors uh, between these two diseases. And as we learn more and as we explore, we have the potential to understand where this physiological uh, connection exists. Uh, on the right of your screen there, you can see a, a picture of angiolipoma with a mast cell from a slide that Dr. Herbst took. Uh, and it's pretty clear the role that mast cell plays in so many of these different uh, diseases. Now, uh, before we start talking about specific case examples, I want to say that, like Dr. Herbst made clear, each case of Durkheim's is unique. While there's some similar uh, threads that connect them, each one has its own presentation, and uh, we, uh, we as uh, in the medical field, and uh, when we're looking at Durkheim's and each patient, we have to understand it in context of their environment, of their background, of their genetics. Dr. Herbst talked about the, the role that genes might, might be playing in Durkheim's. And so if we understand that all together in a holistic picture, uh, I think we're much more likely to be able to get the most effective treatments. So for the first case example, that's a 55-year-old female patient and she has a, a really difficult story. She went to over a dozen uh, physicians who uh, you know, blamed it on small things and told her to just try to, try to deal with the pain uh, and kind of pushed off the, the experience that she was having. Uh, but fortunately, she was very persistent. She kept moving from doctor to doctor to doctor uh, to try to find what's the cause. Uh, she then ended up actually calling the CDC and spoke with people at their department and they referred 
her over to uh, Total Lipidema Care and to speak with uh, Dr. Herbs to see if they can figure out what's going on. And fortunately, when she came and uh, she, she was able to figure out really what's, what was her, what was her uh, experience with the disease and what has happened, uh, we saw that she did have uh, uh, Durkham's. So now let's talk specifically about her case, starting with her COVID-19 history. So in 2021, August 2021, uh, she received a COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, a few months later in December, that's when the patient first contracted a severe case of COVID-19. And then from that month in December up until May, so for a, a, a few period, a long period, uh, she had persistent COVID symptoms and it was very difficult. She couldn't go to work. Uh, she was pretty much removed from, uh, she was bedridden uh, during those few months. Uh, and it, it was very difficult for her because she continued to have these symptoms and caught, uh, continuous positive COVID-19 tests throughout that period. So now that we understand her COVID history, uh, we'll talk about her Durkham's history. And as you'll see, there's a little bit of overlap. So in April of that year, uh, if you recall, December 2021, she had COVID in April, so a few months later, that's when she started to have uh, initial Durkham symptoms, specifically pain and lipomas in her right thigh, in the front of her right thigh. Then a few weeks later, that's when the symptoms spread to the left thigh, to the front of her left thigh. Uh, following, following that, she started having pain and lipomas in different areas of the body, going to the arms, the stomach. Uh, by September of that year, the symptoms hit the back uh, of the thighs and the buttock shelf and started moving up her body. In December, that's when the shins became involved, and at that point, pretty much, it was manifesting throughout her whole body. Uh, for pain management, she was using a gua sha tool, which provided her temporary pain relief, but unfortunately, uh, the pain was consistent and getting worse. Uh, and a diagnostic tool, so she did get a weighted MRI, uh, which showed uh, evidence of lipomas throughout the body. So that was a lot of information, so we kind of put it on this timeline now of the key events you have in December, COVID-19 being contracted, a few months later, the initial Durkham's disease uh, symptoms. Following that, the symptoms begin to spread to the left thigh, uh, and then in September, really it's starting to manifest throughout the body. So the next case we go to, uh, I wanna show, before we get to there, I wanna show some more medical history of this patient, because I think it's important to understand the differences of these two cases uh, along with the similarities. So she has a medical history of anxiety, diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, fibromyalgia, hypertension, but the key point here is that she did not have a history of lipoma. So she did not have lipomas before her COVID-19 infection. Uh, on the right, you see some of the medications that she's been taking uh, for her hypertension, her dyslipidemia, uh, for her pain management, uh, as well as for sleeping. At the top, you can see she actually began using Ozempic for weight loss uh, and diabetes management since September, so a few months before her COVID experience. And, um, the discussions are to potentially keep her on the Ozempic as well because it might slow her uh, uh, lipoma development, but that's still uh, something for exploration. So we've seen this person, uh, this patient's uh, uh, medical history, and she, as I started at the beginning, it was a difficult experience, but fortunately she's been able to discover what the problem is and now work towards uh, the solution. Now moving to a second case example. This is a 53-year-old uh, female patient. And she has a pretty different uh, experience with how her Durkham's developed. Um, she has a history of FML, of familial multiple lipomatosis, uh, and she also is suggested to be having uh, Ehlers-Danlos and venous insufficiency. She has a history of tick-borne infections, uh, and she contracted a case of COVID-19 in September of 2020. Uh, and she uh, got this, she was a caregiver, a direct caregiver for her son who had developed it and a few days later, that's when she uh, came down with COVID. Uh, and she became very ill. She had a heart rate above 100 beats per minute. Uh, and she had uh, multiple days of vomiting. Um, the reason I say likely case is she unfortunately couldn't test positive. She couldn't create antibodies for the, uh, for the virus. But uh, we consider her a, a case of COVID-19. Uh, her Durkham's experience now. You can see that, uh, like I mentioned before, she had lipomas in her legs, but in October, so a month after her experience with severe COVID, uh, that's when they started to become painful, severely painful. Uh, they had not been painful prior to her COVID-19 experience, and she began developing new uh, lipomas on her hips uh, and then throughout the rest of her body. Prior to COVID, uh, she had only 10 lipomas throughout her body. Uh, following COVID, she received an ultrasound, and that ultrasound showed that she had over 50 
lipomas throughout her body. And that, there's much more than 50. They just stopped counting after 50. Uh, and then in May, those, uh, those lipomas started growing faster and the pain started getting worse as well. So her other symptoms as well that came along following COVID, um, she had neuralgia in both arms, numbness on the pinky side of her hands, uh, lymph node swelling, uh, burning from the neck down, roving nerve pain, and lightheadedness. So as you can see, this a really all-encompassing uh, painful disease for her uh, that, that really developed following her COVID-19 experience. So now, we talked about two cases, and where do we go from here? And what's the point of this talk today? So the, the goal of our talk right now is really to prompt further exploration about this link of COVID-19 and Durkham's. I think it's really important to understand it from multiple different angles uh, and in context of how other infectious diseases affect uh, and are associated with the development of Durkham's disease. So in uh, conversation with uh, different clinicians and uh, different researchers, we've come to this list of further questions that we hope to keep looking at, uh, particularly the mechanisms. We spoke about the potential of mast cell connection, the mast cell activation connection uh, to Durkham's. Um, does the role of COVID-19 play, the severity of it, play a role in how the Durkham's develops? I was speaking with Dr. Eicher about how most of the patients she, she has seen have had a very severe case of uh, COVID before developing the, the Durkham's, but we want to see um, really what, what measurable impact the, the severity has on Durkham's development. The next we want to look at is a prevention. So now uh, that we understand this link, we want to see if there's anything we can do to help people who have had COVID prevent potentially from uh, developing Durkham's following that. Uh, repeat COVID infections, whether that tends to make it worse, uh, whether the vaccination along with infection makes it worse or uh, maybe doesn't, uh, helps prevent the develop of Durkham's following. And then any similarities there are in lipedema with uh, COVID and whether that, uh, a similar pathway might play a role in uh, the lipedema pathway. Um, before we talk about potential impacts, I want to touch on treatment. So treatment for Durkham's, as, as many know, is just very difficult. The way that it manifests throughout the body is a uh, really challenge to address. And uh, fortunately, there's, uh, we're working towards research to figure out best ways to treat it. Uh, for lipedema, so at TLC, at Total Lipedema Care, fortunately, we've gotten pretty good at treating lipedema with high rates of uh, effective uh, treatment following their uh, uh, diagnosis of lipedema. Uh, for Durkham's, using traditional methods, uh, uh, surgical methods, sometimes they get up to 60 or 70 percent better, but not up to 100 uh, percent. Dr. Schwartz is exploring new ways of potentially getting all the disease tissue out with big, uh, taking out uh, all those, uh, the nodules of Durkham's, which I showed a picture of earlier during the talk, uh, and that's a potential way to have better outcomes, but that's also something that uh, we're looking at for uh, research and understanding what impact uh, that can make. So hundreds of millions of people have had COVID. So there's a significant impact that we can try to see that comes from COVID towards Durkham's uh, disease. And while Durkham's is rare, it's still such an important a challenge and it's such, it can become a, much, a very debilitating uh, aspect and especially when people are turned away uh, from physicians, like I mentioned in the first case, going to more than 14 physicians before finally uh, talking to the CDC and then finding her way uh, to find a solution. Uh, re really, we want to improve that. We want to f improve the pathway that people get from when they're feeling this pain so that they understand what's going on and so that they can more quickly begin getting treatment uh, before they have to live with such difficult challenges. Uh, particularly, this is, goes back to the importance of what we've, talking, what we've been talking about all conference is raising awareness among all physicians. So a small percent of phys physicians understand lipedema, understand Durkham's. So by increasing li literature and increasing our understanding of uh, the potential effects and associations of uh, things like COVID and other infectious diseases, uh, we have a lot of potential to understand, um, understand how people are dealing with the pain and how to improve that pain for them. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a lot of research that's still looking at this connection. We're working with uh, Dr. Eicher, Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Herbs, uh, at looking at dozens of patients that we've personally seen at the office uh, that are facing this challenge of Durkham's following their COVID. And like I said uh, at the beginning, each patient's case is unique. So even though we have some similarities, some did have lipomas before, some didn't, uh, some had a very severe case of COVID and some had less so. So understanding the different ways that it manifests is a big essential part of us approaching this uh, link and association of COVID-19 and Durkham's. Uh, and with that, thank you all so much for your attention and for uh, being here at the Fathisword Research Society. Thank you, everyone.
We do have a couple questions, and I do just want to uh, mention to when, um, with just to make a general announcement regarding questions, is that if questions aren't, this per presentation is on some research and some case study, and so we're not going to be prepared to answer questions on treatment in this particular session. So with that being said, here's an interesting one. I, this is, uh, someone wrote in and said, I lost all of my Durkham's and lipedema pain after COVID-19. That's fascinating. <laughs> and that's great. And I think that goes towards the, the exploration, the type of research we're trying to do now is really a broad net. So we, uh, and hopefully whoever wrote that can come and contact us. Here's the contact slide, actually. So send us an email, please. Uh, we are trying to capture as much information as we can. And so whether it helped or hurt you, uh, COVID and your Durkheim's experience, uh, please, we're, we're, we're really excited to talk with people because it really comes down to the patients. Unfortunately, it has to many times come to the patients finding their way persistent and um, get, getting to the answer. So, and we're trying to help make that process easier. But if you have had an experience with COVID uh, and with Durkheim's, whether it's gotten better or worse, please uh, contact us. And we're really excited to work with you to find this association, find a link, and find ways to improve it. So thank you for the question. And by any chance, do you have a general sense of how many patients have presented um, with this? So there's been, uh, Dr. Eicher specifically has seen a lot of patients in her office. We've also, Dr. Herbst and Dr. Schwartz, seen a lot of patients. Uh, now, one, one interesting thing that I didn't mention is that the patient that came from the CDC uh, had told us that the CDC mentioned to her that there's been potentially thousands of people who have reported to the CDC uh, that they've developed Durkheim's after uh, COVID-19. And we've been in contact with the CDC. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a little slow uh, with working with uh, agencies. They have a lot on their uh, plate. But we're working with the CDC to try to get their numbers. Um, apparently, it's lower than the 20,000 number at the CDC currently uh, of people who've reported it. So it's, there's less information available. Um, but th there's potentially a lot more people affected who just don't know why they're having pain following their COVID. So that's something that we really want to uh, explore further, too. Thank you, Noah. And Thank take you. all of your research and, uh, with you to, with, for medical school, and we look forward to having you back when Thank you're you. practicing and treating all of us one day. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you.